Well, good morning and welcome on this uh, really special day. Special because it's the Lord's Day and it's the Sabbath day. And uh, the, the, the scripture reminds us that we should not neglect the meeting together because it's really important as a body of God's people that we are gathered together to encourage each other. Yes, to hear God's word preached, but also to corporately worship and to pray together. Thank you for those who came up here yesterday uh, to uh, spend some time in prayer. Kevin's going to be speaking a bit more about that a bit later. But we're going to stand and we're going to start by singing two songs.
blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. seated as we pray together. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. We thank you that we have an opportunity to praise our Saviour all the day long. We know, Father, that we can praise your name, we can worship you, we can glorify you wherever we are. But there's something very special about when your people come together. And Father, we thank you that you have brought us here this morning, that we might share fellowship with each other. Throughout the week, we mix with people of all sorts and from all types of backgrounds. Many and far too many know nothing of the things of God. And so it is a true delight to be here today, to meet with those of like-mindedness, to meet with those who have a real desire to worship you. For we know that we join with many millions across the world, worshiping the one true living God. And that even now in heaven itself, angels fall down and myriad upon myriad of believers fall down and say, worthy is the Lamb. We pray, Father God, that you would just help us to be aware of your presence. You would help us, Father, to be at ease with each other and with ourselves. Father, we pray that the cares of this world will have no impact upon us today. For we just want to focus upon you, upon your Son. We want to hear your word, yes. But we want to see you glorified. We want to see Jesus risen and exalted. For this is our story. This is our song that we should praise our Saviour all the day long. For he has much to teach us, much to show us, much to reveal to us. As he did to his disciples so long ago. Father, we're reminded how the Lord Jesus prayed so often. And we would seek over the coming days to follow that example. But we do so now as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. 
Amen. I'm going to invite the wonderful Andy up the front now, and he's going to inform us of all that is yet to come. For the week, anyway. <laughs> Good morning. Am I on? Sound on. It's on. Green lights. Yes, better. I'm at that age where I don't know whether I'm better with or without glasses. I don't know what that tells you. Okay, good morning, everybody. And first of all, uh, a big thank you from me for everybody that um, supported the prayer uh, uh, 12 hours yesterday. Uh, Claire and I were up here for an hour, and it was it was a great a great hour. So uh, um, thank you for everyone that attended. Um, our service this morning has been led by the wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Eric, you're so good, Andy, aren't you? No wonder you've got the job. <laughs> and uh, he will also be uh, appearing on Zoom. Um, during the week, on Tuesday, we have Little Cubs at 9.30. And um, this week at 7.30, we have our uh, diaconate meeting here at the main church. Um, and there will also be house groups uh, as normal. Uh, at eight o'clock. Um, same on Wednesday, house groups um, uh, at eight o'clock. At the moment, they're still on Zoom, but we are hopeful that we can uh, we can change that over the, the forthcoming weeks when the uh, restrictions change. Thursday, we have our coffee morning here at 10 a.m. And next Sunday, uh, kids' church in the morning at 9.45, followed by our main worship morning worship, uh, which will be led by Yona. Uh, and a few special days to mention. Um, on the 15th, it's birthdays for Kevin and Barbara. So happy birthday to uh, Kevin and Barbara on the 15th. Um, and on the 16th, Kevin and Ruth have a wedding anniversary. And I'm sure the wedding date was planned with uh, uh, Kevin's birthday in mind, so he doesn't forget. Um, and there's also a big birthday on the 16th as well. Um, my sister, for one, but uh, also Kim, uh, Kim White will be celebrating a big birthday. Um, but I'll leave it to you to work out how old she's going to be, because I'm not brave enough. And that is it for me. Thank you. Um, Kevin's going to come up. Now. Oh, Kevin. I think she's 30, and we don't tell anybody. I didn't think she was old. It's helpful if, you, if your wedding anniversary is the day after your birthday, isn't it? So you can't forget. There was another reason uh, I wouldn't get married in the football season, so it had to be July, August, uh, before we could, so we could get married. But yeah, Andy mentioned about the prayer a day yesterday. It was really good to have uh, this, this time of prayer, and um, 12 hours covered here at the church, people at home. Uh, it was a really special time for those who came here, and I think we can all say that. Uh, those who came, those at home, I'm sure we had a, a special time as well. We did say last week that uh, we're sort of designating this week coming as a, uh, as a week of prayer and fasting, and so just on a, a little bit on, on that. I um, don't know whether you've fasted before. It's, perhaps it's not something that we've, we've talked much on in the past, uh, but it's something that some of us do, have done. So fasting is obviously abstaining from something, normally food, to uh, deny our flesh so we can concentrate more on God. So what, we, what we're asking is that if you could take a time next week to fast and to pray. So it's not just a case of, of missing a meal, it's, it's praying during the time you would have been having that meal, but it doesn't have to be food. Maybe you could fast your internet for a few days. But... What fasting does, okay, it, it does not change God in any way. Fasting does not change God's mind about something that we're asking him for. Fasting does, is not a magic formula to get our, our desires done. But fasting is something that, that helps us as individuals. 
I was reading uh, about this this week and I came across a, a really good illustration, so I'm going to tell you a story. There was a young lumberjack uh, and he wanted to enter the lumberjack contest because he thought he was, he was young enough and strong enough and he could win this. And he, he got down to the last round and he was in, in the final with this champion lumberjacker who'd been champion for years, an older guy. And this young guy thought I could easily beat him. And so when the, when the day of the competition came, they, uh, they started off and, and he, this young lumberjack chopped and chopped and chopped all day. And he, and he was chopping all these trees down and, and he, he kept looking over at the older guy who, who would chop for about 45 minutes and then take a 15 minute break. Okay, but this younger guy kept chop, chop, chopping. And it got to the end, and the older guy won because he cut down more trees. And this younger lumberjack, he, he really couldn't understand how that could happen. He said, how can you have got chopped down more trees than me? You stop for a tea break every, 50, every 45 minutes, but I carried on chopping all day. How did you chop down more than me? And the, lumberjacks, the old lumberjack said to him, you see, while I had my 15 minute tea break, I sharpened my axe. Okay. Fasting is like sharpening your axe. And that's a really good illustration, isn't it? So when we come before God and, and we fast, we're sharpening our axe. We're sharpening ourselves. We're getting ourselves into a position where we are more able to hear from God. So that's what it's about. So we're just asking if sometime next week, if you want to, you would participate in a, in a, in a time of fasting and a time of prayer. We're not asking anyone who has a medical condition to not eat or drink. If you've never fasted food before, don't fast liquids. Uh, don't, you know, still take liquids, but just fast the food. But it's a really good way of, of, of getting into God's presence and, and, and praying and hearing from God. So that's what we're going to ask this week. Any time this week, there's no set time, no set day, no set length. But just what, you're, what you feel comfortable with. It's, it's not a, a competition of endurance. You know, if you fast one meal a day, one meal for one day, and just spend that time in God's presence, that would be great. Thank you. Well done, Kevin. There's no doubt fasting is a real challenge, and uh, particularly fasting from the television, eight o'clock tonight might be uh, a good way of combating that challenge, I guess. Now, young people, I know you're busy, but if you could listen just for a second, we've got eight more days left at school. What happens after school finishes? What, or what are we on? Yes. Some holidays. Okay, you come up the front. You come up the front for me, please. Now, holidays are really exciting places. Now, Trevor's just been on holiday with Barbara, who looks younger than Trevor. Uh, Kevin, I mean, and Trevor. So, Trevor, could you come up as well, please? Okay. You need to take your mask off. Where have you been on holiday, Trevor? Haysborough. Haysborough, Norfolk. Norfolk. How did you get there? By car. By car. Okay. Could you like to sit on that step for me there, Trevor? Okay. And where about are you going on holiday? Yeah. Yeah. Where about you going to go? How would you get there, do you think? By car? Maybe. Maybe? Okay. We know on Christmas that we're going to Spain for Christmas. Oh, so you'd have a plane. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, if you could sit on that step there for me. Okay. Now, also, someone has to be on holiday, haven't you, Raymond? Yes. If you could come up the front as well for me, please. Okay. Where have you been? Peak District. Peak District. And how did you get there? By car. By car. Okay, excellent. If you can sit next to Trevor. And if we could have somebody else come up the front, who wants to come up the front and help me, one person. Quick, to Rebecca, could you come up? Come up and help me? Yes, okay, great stuff, okay. Okay, what did Daddy just say to Rebecca? He's gonna buy some sweets later. No, well he should do. Come up the front here, darling, sit here for me, okay. Are you going on holiday? You might go on a boat. Now I love going on boats, and I particularly love going on boats when it's really rough, and rougher the better actually, because you know, when the boat's going up and down like that from the side to side, it's really exciting, otherwise it's a bit boring. We go to France sometimes with somebody, as soon as there's a slight pump, oh, I feel a bit queasy. That means sick, but we don't say that word here because that's not a nice word to say. So, but being on a boat is really good. Now, I just need somebody else to come and help me. Who's going to come up and help me? Who wants to come? You going to come up? Ella, can you come up? Yes? No? Who's come? Anybody come up? If not, I'll pick somebody else out. Come on then, I become. And I, I called her Ella, but it's not Ella, is it? 
I'm really good at names. I haven't changed at all with not being able to remember people's names. Georgia. Emily. Emily. Um, Emily. Okay, right. Emily, I want you to come up there, up here for me. Because four people got in a boat and they decided that they would go across a big sea, a lake, like I see it was. And somebody else got in with them. And this person sat down in the back of the boat. Just sit down. And immediately the sun was really hot and they fell asleep. And so it was time to go to the other side of the boat. So the people in the, in the boat started to row the boat. You've got to watch me. You've got to hold the oars like this. Now, like, like this. And then you lean back and forward and back and forward. And, and the sun's lovely and it's shining. And the wind is just so gentle and it's blowing. And the person at the back fast asleep, enjoying the rest. And, but as they get further out on the lake, the wind starts to blow really hard, goes whoosh, and the waves start to crash, and so they grow even harder, and it's getting really, really hard, and, and, and they begin to get quite frightened, and they think they're going to drown, because the waves start to come over the boat, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden they realise that somebody's asleep, and they turn around, and they wake up, and say, wake up, wake up, wake up. and the person stands up, can you stand up? Keep going, keep going. Don't stop. You're going to go down otherwise. Be quiet. Shout out. Be quiet. Shout out. Be still. Shout out. Be still. <laughs> Your voice has changed, hasn't it? <laughs> and with that, the wind stopped. And the waves stopped. And the people in the boat could relax a bit. They didn't have to row quite so hard because the waves weren't blowing anymore. <laughs> because. The person in the back was the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus started to say, be quiet to the wind and the waves. And they suddenly realized that Jesus had power and authority over everything. But they learned a more important lesson that day, that even when they had forgotten it, Jesus was still with them. And so, we're over the other side now, so you can stop. She can hear us. Okay. And so they, they, re they realized that even though they had forgotten that Jesus was in the boat with them, he was there all the time. And all that they had to do was to ask him. And as soon as they asked him to help, he helped them. And young people, and that's our older ones, except for Kim, because she's only 30. Let's remember today that Jesus has power and authority, but also he is with us all the time, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, even if we forget, Jesus is always with us. And all we have to do is to say, Jesus, please help me. And he always does. Isn't that wonderful? Good. Give our friends a big round of applause. You all go back to your seats now. Well okay, well, you did really well, you boys. Excellent. So next time you go on holiday, on a, on a plane or a boat or a train or whatever it is, then just remember, wherever we are and whatever we're doing, the Lord Jesus is with us always. Now, we're going to sing a song now, and it's called One Way. One Way Jesus. Okay.
sing, how low can you go? And we're going to sing, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, let me hear you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. We live by faith and not by sight for you. We're living all for you. I'm be higher. You are the way. because I'm a man, I guess. Anyway, we're going to focus on God's word now. And so we're going to turn to John's gospel and chapter 14. And uh, we're going to read uh, from verse 1 through to verse perhaps um, 21. John's gospel, chapter 14. Uh, reading from verse 1. And this is the new uh, international version. And it reads in this fashion. Do not let your hearts be troubled, for you believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many mansions. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Uh, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How then can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. Or at least, believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and will be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Uh, The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before the long, the world will see me no more, and you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Whoever has my commands and keeps them 
is the one who loves me. And we trust God will bless the reading of that word as we just pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for reminding us this morning that there is only one way, and that is your Son, the Lord Jesus, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we thank you, Father, that that great truth has been revealed to us and has been made known to us through your Holy Spirit. We confess, Father, that often this past week there have been moments, perhaps even hours or even days, where the thought of yourself has not crossed our mind. Forgive us for that. Help us to remain focused always that you are with us, even at times when we forget, for we know that you are ever faithful. Father, we know that we live in some very uncertain days and that for many, life holds many fears and anxieties. But we thank you that your Son has come, that we might have peace, a peace that passes all understanding, not a wishy-washy hope, but a real living hope in the risen Christ Jesus who has granted us everlasting life, who says, peace, be still. Father, we know that we will pass through calamities, we will pass through storms and, and difficulties, but you are there always, constant and consistent. And that's why we sing, one way Jesus, for he is the way, the truth and the life. Help us, we pray, to that, have that renewed sense of your presence, that renewed understanding of who you are, and actually what you have done for us, because it's so easy for us to forget the magnitude of, of, of the cross and the awesomeness of the death of Christ and what that achieved. And that our sins, though they are red like scarlet, have been made white as the white as snow. And that we stand before you as those clothed in righteousness, not clothed in filthy rags, but in robes of righteousness, which, help, which enables us to be acceptable in your sight. For we know that nothing good lives in us. Yet your Son is in us and we are in him. Therefore we have free and open access to the very throne room of God. And we rejoice at that great truth. Father, we pray this morning, this day, that as we share this continuing time together, you will help us to really know that we are your people that we will grasp the reality of what it is to be a disciple of Christ Jesus. And that we will really know, Father, that you are ever faithful. Father, our land is, is pagan. And for the most part, forsaken all of your ways. Have mercy on our land. Restore again the honour of your name. Bring about, Father, that revival that we long for. Help us not to hide in the shadows. Help us to be that light on a hill. Help our saltiness to be such that all might see your glory and our lives might bear witness that you are the Lord God Almighty. Help us not shrink away from opportunity to speak of you. Father, we pray for our government. We pray for our royal family who have their own sets of difficulties and problems. But we pray for our families, our friends, our neighbours, those who do not know the things of God or have chosen not to know them. Again, further, have, Father, have mercy on our land. And we know that you are a great God and do great things. A God who performs miracles. Father, your son, as we reminded us, said that whatever we ask in his name, so it will be. We would even dare pray for a positive result tonight, Father. How that would lift our nation. What good that would bring. Father, we can then give testimony about the greatness of our God. Not that it depends upon a football result. Of course not, and that's foolishness. But Father, we know how important that is to so many. And sadly, it takes priority over many things. Help us in this week of prayer and fasting to be led by your Holy Spirit, directed by your Holy Spirit. Let us do these things secretly and quietly, lest we should be guilty of boasting about them. We know, Father, that there is great power in prayer. And when your people really, really grasp the, the strength of, power of prayer, 
what an impact that can make upon our community, upon the life of this church, upon the life of our nation globally. Because, Father, we know that there is only one way, and that is Jesus. And we love you as our Heavenly Father. We love your Son as our Saviour. We love your Spirit as our Helper. And we pray, Father God, that each and every day that love will increase. Our awareness of your presence will become that much more real. And that our witness will become that much more effective. We pray for our young people who face so many challenges, more than we've ever faced before, who are influenced in such a way, Father, that we could, when we were their age, couldn't even contemplate it. We pray for their safety. We pray, Father, that you will just protect them from the enemy, protect them from the influences of, of the darkness of the enemy, and that they will, in their, in, even in their youthfulness and in their youngness, will know in their hearts that Jesus belongs to them and they belong to Jesus. For we know, Father God, that he blessed them and coveted them so we would do the same, Father. We would bless our children, our young people. We would covet them for the kingdom of God. And those who are not here, perhaps family members, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, neighbours' children, schools, Father. Schools, such great places of influence. May they not lose sight of the responsibility to teach about the living God. So, Father, in a few moments we're going to look at your word. It's forever new. It might be forever old as well. Such is the message of salvation. But again, Father, we pray that whatever comes from the front here, your Holy Spirit will just impart that which he wants us to know. Because we know, Father, all Scripture is useful for teaching, instruction, for training and for rebuking. Because it's the Word of God. So we surrender the rest of this day, the rest of this few moments allotted to us as we rejoice that Jesus is the one way. And Father, that truly is our story. That truly is our song. That we love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We've been very privileged as a church over recent weeks and months to have some teaching from Kevin in the morning uh, on Joshua, and then from Jonah on Philippians, two books, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, separated by the fact one is in the Old, one is in the New, but separated also by 700 years of history, during which time the world continued to turn and to evolve. But in that time, the Son of God came and God's purposes were being revealed. But there is a link that binds these two books together because actually they are full of challenges and we know that Joshua was faced with the challenge of the, of the promised land, full of conflict. And we know that in Philippians we've got this inward conflict going on. And then there is the cost involved. And we know that to follow Christ comes at great cost, potentially. But also they're linked together because it's full of promise, power and prospect. The promise of God that he would, he would fight for the Israelites. The power that God revealed through his son, the Lord Jesus, as we know in Philippians. And the prospect of the promised land, spoken of to Joshua, but also spoken to us. For we have that great prospect of heaven itself, eternal, everlasting life. And then lastly, they're linked together by three things. By action. Joshua was instructed to, to move on. Why are you standing there, Joshua? Get the men together, march forward and see what God will do. The book of Philippians reminds us that we are men of action, that we are a people of power. And they're linked together because they have the same author, handwritten by God's Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, they are linked together because actually God decreed that they would form part of his Holy Word, the Bible that we have to our hands now. But actually, at the end of it, it's all about authority. With what authority did, did Joshua march into the promised land, into the land of Canaan? What authority did Paul write to the church at Philippi and issue them with commands? And I want us to think this morning for a few moments about authority and the place of authority in our own lives, the priority that we give to it. 
In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and then 20, Jesus says this, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, all authority given to the Lord Jesus. And then he goes on to say, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, to obey everything, not just part of the word of God, but to obey it all, so that we might indeed be the people that God wants us to be. And then in Acts we read that famous statement that Peter and James and the apostles make, that we must obey God rather than me. Why? Why then should we obey the authority of God? Why should we then obey the authority of Christ? Yeah, the Bible instructs us that we should do so, and it's not needful, Paul says, or Peter says, we must obey God rather than man. And we are living in the 22nd century, I guess almost now, aren't we? I think that's how they work it out, I'm not quite sure. I think the, anyway, it doesn't matter. But when we are being asked to compromise more and more our Christian values and the word of God so that we are seen to be politically correct and on board with the thinking of, of the waywardness and the pervertedness of men's and women's hearts. And there is this attitude that, that is permeating through society today that to say otherwise is wrong. And our government are actually in debate at the moment about what laws they can bring in to ensure that nothing is beyond availability. That's the right word to use. But we're reminded that all authority is given to Jesus. Authority, yes, over nature, when he stilled the storm, over sickness as he healed the leper, over death as he raised the dead to life, over sin as he rose to victory from Calvary's tree. Oh, to being in that tomb. And the Lord Jesus, his final words almost to us was this, that we must obey the commands he's given to us. And that's really tough, isn't it? That's a real tough challenge that we have to face up to. Because actually, when we think about authority, there is a hostility which challenges authority. There is something within us that kicks against being told what to do. You know, when I was living at home and, and under the control of my, my parents, I couldn't wait to get my own house. I could do what I like. Can I? Of course I can't. Because even at home, there's the wife. No, there is. But, there is. but, but we, are, we are bound by the constraints, aren't we? Of, of, of the land in which, and the laws and, and all this sort of thing. But it's a common thing to have this hostility against authority. For whatever reason, it really grates, for the most part, and I generalise when I say that. But just see a sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. And what do you do, Steve? It's wet, isn't it? Because for whatever reason, if you tell somebody not to do it, they will do it. Is that right? Did I say that right? If you tell them not to do it, they'll do it. Yeah. It's like a teenager, isn't it? If you don't want them to do something, tell them to do it. And then they will do the opposite and they will end up doing what you wanted them to do in the first place. But in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we, we read a really sad period of the Israelites' history. Where their history was that God had authority over them. God had commanded them, God had governed them, God had led them, God had protected them. And then all of a sudden they say, we no longer want God to lead us, but we want a king to rule over us. And we have this blatant rejection of God for the favour of having a king, a, a mere mortal man lead them with all the consequences that would bring. And yet they chose that. And it's not new. This hostility against authority is, is as old as the, 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 the old hats, as they say. And we all suffer with that to a greater or lesser extent. This hostility against authority. But we just need to be aware that not only is it common, but it's costly as well. You know, there are... There are checks and balances, there are consequences for our actions. 
And, and sometimes we don't understand, appreciate fully the consequences of what we're doing. We, we almost live for short-term gain, for, for long-term loss. And it's very easy, isn't it, to get dragged along and thinking that's okay to do that, it won't do any harm. But actually we need to be very mindful that whatever we do has a consequence waiting to happen. Now sometimes that consequence is, is quite insignificant, but sometimes it can have life-changing effects. And we don't always think about that. I've got a bit of a grotty back and it's really paining me at the moment. Uh, and that's because as a young man I used to jump down all the stairs. I come to the flight of stairs and I couldn't walk down them, I'd just jump down the 20 stairs and, and whatever. And they used to say to me, you'll end up with a bad back. No, I won't. No, I won't. You know, I'm young, I'm fit, I can do all those things. Uh, and, and, and we sometimes forget the consequences because we, we're so focused on what's going to happen now. I'm reminded how the children of Israel were standing on the edge of the promised land. And they said, they are so heavy it takes two men to carry them. And they give this report about what the land is like. And, and they say, it's awesome. You know, it's great. There's plenty of, of room. It's fertile. It's fruitful. But the people who live there, now that's a different question. They make us look like grasshoppers. We have the illusion that they are unbeatable. We can't go in there. The risk is too great. We should come to harm. And so for 40 years, they end up wandering the wilderness. And not one of those men who came out of Egypt ended up in the promised land. They all perished where they were. And there is a cost when we flout authority. Have you ever been stopped for speeding? Don't put your hand up. Because <laughs> it's embarrassing, isn't it? But it's fine, isn't it? Until you get stopped. And yet there's nothing wrong with going 40 or 50 and 30 mile an hour because we can all drive safely. We're all wonderful drivers, aren't we? Most of us men are anyway. And, and, then, and then there's a little blue light. And, and, and this guy comes and he says, um, what do you think you're doing? We say, oh, I'm really sorry, officer. I wasn't aware of what I was doing. And then we get a ticket and we get a fine and, and suddenly the joy of speeding is not so great. We went to France with Adam two years ago. Don't tell him I'm telling you this. And when we get there, I say, Adam, it's kilometres, not miles per hour. It's fine, Daddy. I know what I'm doing. We go to Egypt, we come back and there's a letter from France. Dear Mr. Blows, you've been caught speeding in Paris. And 70 euro fine or something ridiculous like that. It wasn't so great then. And sometimes, you know, we just need to be very mindful, don't we? That when we flout authority, not just the authority of the land, but authority of God's word, there are consequences for that. And people today say there is no God. That we don't need to read the Bible. We don't need to, to live as Christ would have us to live. We, we're okay. All things are lawful, yes, it's true, but not all things are helpful. There are consequences, aren't there? There's consequences for ignoring the law of God and the word of God. You know, Job, bless his heart, was a man that we're going to talk about in a minute. Because there's a history which casts away authority. The fact is that men and women are born as sinners. In Psalm 51, David says, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin, or in sin, my mother conceived me. This concept of inherited sin is an alien concept for so many people. We learn to do wrong. No, we don't learn to do wrong. We naturally do that which is wrong. Those of us that have had babies can soon tell you, children soon learn... If they don't get their own way, if they scream and shout and kick, they get their own way. Where does that come from? Nobody teaches it. It's because within us there is that sinful, selfish nature that wants our own way all the time. I don't know if you saw this on the television, you know, the, uh, the um, Prime Minister was asked the question, and I'll mention that in just a moment. But Job says, teach me and I will be quiet. Show me where I have been wrong. 
Teach me where I have been wrong. The Bible reminds us, doesn't it, that all have sinned. All have fall short of God's glory. There is no, not one that is righteous, not no one. And, and yet there is a concept that actually the heart of man is good. And we use that in a generic way, don't we? But actually the heart of man is evil beyond measure. Because it's born, it's created in sin and in iniquity. Yes, and, and we have the fruits of that sinfulness makes itself known throughout our lifetimes. Always wanting our own way, wanting to argue all the time, doing that which is wrong. We have to work at being good. We have to work hard at being the people God wants us to do. It's easier to talk about somebody in a negative way than it is in a good way. It's easier to, to speed in our car than it is to maintain the speed level. Uh, and, and what have you. The fact is, all of us flout authority. Because actually it's foolishness. The folly of man is a sinner. Psalm 41 says, the fool says in his heart there is no God. And this is what I was going to say to you. I was listening to the news a while ago and Boris Johnson was being interviewed. I don't know if you saw it, but, but the, the, for whatever reason, the interviewer said, Boris, do you believe in God? Straightforward question, isn't it? And he's a politician. Do politicians answer straightforward questions? No, of course not. And so he fudged around it and, uh, and didn't sort of answer. Uh, and then the, the interviewer kept saying, but Boris, or Mr Johnson, perhaps he did say Boris, I don't know. He said, do you believe there's a God? Because Keir Starmer said there's no God. I think that's what prompted it. And so Boris thinks about it and then he sort of very complicatedly says, the fool says, now it's a foolish man who says there is no God. Where he stands, well, you know, we're not going to debate that. That's for us not to say, is it? But actually, it's foolishness. A, to deny that all have sinned. It's foolishness, B, to deny the fact that there is a God in heaven who gave his son, the Lord Jesus. And it's certainly foolishness to say that, that we do not sin. But that history within us easily, so readily, puts away authority. But we need to be careful because actually there is hypocrisy which condemns authority. Because there is indifference between many Christians. In Romans chapter 1, the Romans are, are answering Paul's questions and, and, and replying to his teaching. And Paul's been talking about the grace of God. And how wonderful the grace of God is and how all-embracing the grace of God is and, and just what a transformation it brings to people's lives. And so the Romans say, well, that's good. We love the grace of God, so we shall sin even more that grace may abound. So the more we sin, the more God's grace, the more glory comes to God. So let's sin even more. And what does Paul say? By all means, no. We sin because we are sinners. We do not sin because we are saved and redeemed people of God. And we have to make that conscious choice. But there is a hypocrisy almost amongst so many Christians that actually we're saved now. I'm going to heaven. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm no longer under condemnation. I'm a new creature. Therefore, it doesn't matter what I say or what I do. Rubbish. We are the people of God. We are children of God. We are sight and salt and light in the world. And therefore what we say, what we do, how we act matters immeasurably. Because people see Christ in us and make a judgment. Why is it then that people say, I won't go to church because it's full of hypocrites? Well, come and join us. There'll be one more then, won't there? But it's true, isn't it? It's really difficult. I find it incredible how some people, when they get behind the wheel of a car, 
become different people. We were coming back from Wivenhoe the other week, at Wivenhoe somewhere, anyway, and we went on the roundabout by the um, Ipswich, at the bottom of Ipswich Road, you know, that big roundabout there, and um, now by the university. And there's about six roundabouts there. Nobody ever knows what to do, but I always do, because I'm a good driver. <laughs> and this guy, he came round from the right, and another guy came round from the right, and he thought he had right away, and I thought he was going to explode. He was shouting, and he was waving his fist, and it was just unbelievable. It's as if he transformed into an animal behind his, the wheel of his car. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, and I mean this very respectfully and very lovely, lovingly, we can be one thing here now, but out in the world, amongst our family, amongst our world place, we can be just like anybody else. And we can lose our identity. And we can just be like the neighbour next door to us. Because you see, there is a hypocrisy. Because there is an inconsistency in the way that we live. How the Lord Jesus accused the scribes and the Pharisees, didn't he? He called them whitewashed sepulchres. That on the outside, they're clean. Can do no wrong. And yet on the inside they are full of dead men's bones. Full of dead men's bones. There, there's almost a, a, a conflict there, isn't there? And we can be excused for being pious and righteous and holy and, and, and sanctimonious and all of those things, but actually the reality is that we can be just like anybody else. We've only got to read the pages of Scripture before we identify and see how quickly we can fall. So we need to be on our guard. Scripture says, be on your guard for the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. Here I'm, going, I'm reading through the book of Job at the moment. It's part of my, my quiet time reading. And, and it's just amazing how Satan appears before God. And, and God says, look at Job. Is there a man like him, more righteous, more holy? And Job says, yeah, but he only loves you because of. You know, we worship God, we sing hallelujah to our Saviour when all is well. But when things start going wrong, when we are faced with life's challenges and the difficulties and we're confronted with opposition, it's so difficult, isn't it, to shrink back and to become that old person that we were. And the scribes and Pharisees, oh, they could pray. You know, they could pray the hind legs of a donkey. And they loved it. And everybody applauded them, but on the inside, it's a different matter. Let's remember, let's remember who we are. Stories told, isn't it, of a little boy who goes to Sunday school and the pre preacher says to him, where's God? And the little boy says, I don't know. And then he comes back next week and, 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 and the minister says to him, where's God? And the little boy says, I don't know. And the little boy turns to his mate and said, we're in trouble here, they've lost God, and they think we've lost him. <laughs> and, and it's so easy, isn't it, to, to, to lose sight. The, the men in the boat, they were right there with Christ. You know, the creator of all things. He was there in the boat with them. But they forgot all about him. They were so caught up with what was happening that they thought they were going to perish. They had the Lord of life there. And it wasn't until they say, don't you care? And he stood up and said, be quiet. And that's exactly what we need to do, isn't it? More and more, remember who walks with us. That Jesus is with us. <laughs> Silly illustration. But I think we all drive differently, men, don't we, when there's a police car behind us? <laughs> only, or if our wife's around. <laughs> if only we would just remember who we are. Because there's a humility which consents to authority. Think of the example of the Saviour of Philippians chapter 4, where we read, He humbled himself and became obedient, even unto death. The Son of God, the darling of heaven, the apple of God's eye, His only begotten Son. He humbled himself and became what? He became obedient to what? To the authority of God. When confronted by Satan uh, in, in the wilderness, 40 days of fasting, 
We only ask him one meal, one day, one week. 40 days. And the enemy comes to him and says, turn these stones into bread. And what did Jesus say? Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That would have been easy, wouldn't it? You know, he took five loaves and two fishes and he fed 5,000 men. He could turn those stones into, into bread. And then the devil takes him to a high place and says, throw yourself down. <laughs> Will he not send his angels to bear you up? And he says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He could easily have done that. And God would have sent his angels and borne him up. And then Satan says, I will give you all the nations of the world and they will worship you. And what did Jesus say? Worship the Lord your God and worship him only. No shortcuts. Jesus knew that the all of heaven would worship him, but he had to go to the cross. And sometimes as Christians, we're too keen to take the easy route. So the example of the Saviour, but it's difficult, isn't it? So lastly, we have the enabling of the Spirit. We read in John 14 there, and he will help you. Joshua standing on the edge of the promised land. He had this host of, of Israelites behind him. Before him he had an enemy that was undefeatable. And then what does God say? As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Just go forward. Do we think God's power is any less now than it was 2,000 years ago? Is his ability to help us and sustain us any weaker than it was 4,000 years ago when he called Abraham out of Ur? Of course not. This is the same God. This is our God. There is a place in our lives for authority. But let's remember there is a hostility which challenges that authority. There's a history which would cast it away. There is hypocrisy which condemns it. But there is a humility which consents to authority having its rightful place. But for us, the place of authority in our lives, remember that Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And what has Jesus commanded us? You should love the Lord your God with part of your heart, part of your soul, part of your mind, part of your said No, with all of it. All of it. it can be no half measures. You know, when, we, when we come to the altar... And, and, and Vicar says, do you take this person to be your husband? We say, well, yeah, I will for a little while. Yeah, I won't give it my all, but just for a little bit. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Of course you don't, with all my heart. And we are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, all that we are, all that we possess. That's the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Who is my neighbour? Jesus was asked, anyone and everyone is our neighbour. Would we willingly do ourselves any harm? Would I willingly say to, I don't know, to Andy, Andy, I'm the most selfish person you could meet. Yeah, I'm rude, I'm arrogant. I spend all my money on, on betting, on, on gambling. Of course I wouldn't. Andy, I'm the best friend you could ever have. Yeah, because I'm funny. Sometimes. And I'm a good friend. And I will never stop being your friend. Yeah, we wouldn't sell ourselves short, would we? And yet we sell each other short all the time. There should be within us a love like no other. Because we are one in Christ. Christ is in us. You are my brothers and my sisters. I am your brother. So very simply for us this morning. Let's respect, yes, the authority of our land where it does not conflict with the teaching of Scripture. Let's be strong about that. But let us be determined in our hearts. Love the Lord our God. With all of our heart. Not just the Sunday bit. Or the prayer meeting bit. Or the home group bit. But with everything that we are. Everything that we possess. And let's endeavour. To love each other as we should. 
remembering that God's Spirit lives in us. And we can do what? All things through Christ who loves us. There is a place of authority in our lives. There is a natural tendency to keep against it. But let us as God's people respond to the commands of our God. Let us respond to the authority of Christ, allowing him to be Lord of every aspect of our lives. As we love the Lord our God, as we love each other, as he has loved us. Amen. Amen. Our final song reminds us that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want. Please stand. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. And I will trust in you, and I will trust in you, for your Father, we thank you that your son said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know me and I know them. They hear my voice and they follow me. 
I lay down my life for my sheep. Father, help us to be a people who are trusting each and every day the Good Shepherd. Thank you for your infinite mercy that has taken away that condemnation. Help us to be willing to submit to your authority and that of your word. For we know, Father, you will lead us home. Home in heaven. A place where we'll always be. So we thank you for our time together this morning. May you continue to encourage us in these coming days. And when we meet again, may we have opportunity to speak of your goodness and of your love and of your mercy. So may now your peace, your grace and your mercy be a portion to us as we each have need for your glory. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, God's only begotten Son. Amen.